Hello, everyone. Um, a very good morning to all of you for coming here. Uh, welcome to the BIPS and Dhaka Tribune Roundtable talk on the topic, The Changing Contours of Terrorism as Threat Assessment. Um, without further delay, I would like to request the moderators, Major General ANM Munirud Zaman, President of BIPS, and Mr. Zafar Sohan, the editor of Dhaka Tribune, to carry on the rest of the session. <coughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tarina, and a very good morning and assalamu alaikum to all of you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming and joining us today to talk on a topic which remains pertinent in all our lives. And the title of the roundtable today aptly describes what is actually happening, and that is the changing contours. As a matter of fact, the threat of terrorism lives in different shapes and forms. Since uh, the landscape of terrorism has changed over the last couple of years, with the Daesh being pushed out of Syria, the fall of Kabul, the killing of Ayman al zahawari and several other incidents in the terrorism landscape has changed the controls. But the threat remains in many manifestations. Terrorism, as we know, is a hydra-headed monster. It doesn't go away. If you cut one head, the next head crops up. We are currently going through a phase when operational terrorism has reduced to an extent. But nevertheless, the threat remains very potent and it is taking different shapes and colors. We now have different forms of terrorism in the shape of religious terrorism, or some would like to call it Islamist terrorism or extremism. We have the threat of saffron extremism in India and the allied implications there. We now have white supremacist extremism and terrorism. So the landscape is not reducing, but is expanding. And that is a reason we need to understand the different manifestations, how it is taking shape. It is also greatly being influenced today by technology and a combination of terrorist ideologies and technology is going to pose new threats to us in the coming days. To talk on these issues, we have an eminent panel of two very well-known experts. Dr. Ashraf is a professor of international relations in the University of Dhaka and a very well-reputed expert on issues of extremism, militancy, terrorism, aspects of policing and intelligence. He has extensively written on these issues and has authored books about this. Shavkat currently heads the Bangladesh Center for Terrorism Research, a specialized unit of BIPs. He's, he's been studying the subject and has grown expertise on the issue over the years, has worked extensively and written about it. He has previously worked for over six years with the ICP VTR in Singapore, which is the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research based at Nanyang University in Singapore. So he is aptly qualified to speak on the issue. So therefore, I will stop here and pass on to our panelists today. And Shafkat, you now have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us here today. I know the traffic has been quite challenging, but we really appreciate your presence here. As the chair mentioned, I have been working on terrorism and violent extremism for nearly 15 years now. And uh, I've worked on this issue both in Bangladesh and abroad. And it's quite uh, interesting to see the kind of changes that have taken place in the way we look at terrorism and violent extremism over the years. When I first started working on this issue, uh, it was still the post 9-11 age, and we were very heavily focused on Al-Qaeda and the, the activities that were taking place at that time. There was a huge focus on 
South Asia, particularly due to the threat in the AFPAC region. But as we sit here in September 2022, uh, the situation is quite different. And we are not only talking now about what I would call uh, religio-political militancy, or in more particularly Islamist militancy, but we also now talk about uh, militancy and extremism, which draws its inspiration from other ideologies as well. And uh, as the chair mentioned, uh, the newest term that's in vogue right now is REMV, religious and ethnic, uh, sorry, racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism. So that is also another challenge that we are uh, dealing with. There are several issues that I want to cover in the next uh, few minutes. And I want to focus more on the trends that are uh, coming up in the horizon. And my co-panelist, Dr. Ashraf, will talk about some of the other challenges that we are facing. When we look at Bangladesh, we have uh, made great progress. And I'm very uh, pleased to say that we have made great progress in the last five years. If we remember July 2016, when the attack on Holy Artisan Bakery happened, and its immediate aftermath, and also before that. And particularly in 2015 and 16, and also part of 2017, we saw a spate of attacks. Uh, we saw attacks of various kinds taking place. We saw uh, uh, even uh, sieges taking place. Like we particularly, I want to mention the siege at Atiyah in Silet in March 2017. So fast forward to 2022, we actually now have a situation where the number of successful attacks have been almost zero for a number of years. And we also see that the groups have been weakened or degraded to a large extent. And that is largely due to the adroit measures taken by our law enforcement and security agencies. We have also seen a significant amount of capacity building in, ter in terms of dealing with the threat of terrorism in Bangladesh. And there we also must acknowledge the help that Bangladesh has received from our international partners. Uh, we now have several specialized agencies within the Bangladesh police and other organs of the government which deal with terrorism. But one of the things that I have consistently mentioned over the years is the, the absence of a successful terrorist attack does in no way denote the absence of the threat of terrorism. The threat is very much there and we are uh, seeing that uh, it is now manifesting itself in various forms. Right now uh, there is a lot of uh, concern about a number of uh, young people going missing. There is concern about uh, uh, people from Ansar al-Islam uh, getting arrested. So those are some of the big uh, issues that are dominating the headlines as far as terrorism is concerned. But we, from the what I would like to call the countering violent extremism response community, which is all of us here in this room, because it's not just a government's job alone, we have to take a long view. Because yes, we have been successful in Bangladesh in degrading the capabilities of this group so they cannot uh, do the kind of attacks that they did in 2015 and 2016. And in many ways, some of the international developments have also helped us. Uh, we were also... Uh, we saw that during the COVID period, particularly with the lockdown and so on, that also had an impact on the terror groups. They were not able to operate either. But they're not, they have not been sitting idle. What we saw instead, and when we talk to our police colleagues, they often mention this, that we saw a greater amount of activity taking place in the cyber domain. So terrorism and violent extremism today is what I call uh, an online-offline combine. There is activity taking place online, coupled with activity taking place in Terra Firma. And therefore, uh, the uh, agencies or the law enforcement and security agencies and the response community as a whole has to constantly look at these two separate domains in order to monitor and counter the threat. When I first started working in JMB 15 years ago, uh, one of their biggest feats was able to release a video because their technological capability was at, uh, quite low at that point. But if we look at today's groups, not just AMB, but several other groups that are in operation, their uh, ability to communicate via apps, uh, internet, uh, gaming platforms, and so on, is actually at a very advanced level. And they're constantly upskilling themselves, if I can use the word. So we are faced with groups which are adaptable, 
constantly evolving and their tactics are changing. So from the response community, the onus is on us also to be adaptable and we also have to evolve the way we counter these groups. The other thing that uh, is very important for us to remember, and I think in Bangladesh we have uh, seen this quite uh, closely as over the years, is that operational measures alone cannot defeat the threat. Uh, Professor Ashraf is going to talk about some of the strategic measures, so I don't want to dwell too much on it. But we have to look at operational and strategic measures going in tandem. Operationally, we have great capability now and we have achieved a lot of success. But ultimately, we are, it's an ideational battle. And when we try to fight an idea or an ideology, the ultimate battle is in the strategic realm. And that's something we have to remember. We're also entering an age where uh, lone wolf terrorism is going to become more of a norm. And we are seeing that in uh, different parts of the world, that people who are self-radicalized or uh, have been have an only very limited contact with a particular group or outfit are carrying out attacks on their own. Uh, gone are the days when uh, an operation could only be planned by a large cell or a large group or what we uh, call mass casualty attacks uh, taking place with uh, years of planning and so on. Today's uh, terrorist groups are increasingly looking at lone wolf terrorism and other more new tactics as well. Another concept that we at BIPS have uh, studied for quite some time is the whole concept of family as a terror unit. And we have seen that in an attack in Surabaya in Indonesia. We have also seen that partially in some of the incidents in Bangladesh, where an entire family unit, the parents, the children, everybody is radicalized. And they are carrying out an operation together. And sometimes the children become unwitting uh, accomplices or victims of this whole act. So these are the kind of uh, challenges we are looking at in terms of structures. Then we come to the whole issue of technology. Because we are no longer talking just about technology as a means of communicating the message or as a means of recruitment. With 3D printing, with machine learning, and with artificial intelligence, the new technologies can also become a source of disruption and a force multiplier for terrorist groups. So from the response community side, we really have to look at how we, will, we are going to deal with disruptive technologies in the coming days. The, we take a lot of comfort from the fact that uh, uh, the operational capabilities of these groups have been degraded, so we are seeing less attacks, and which is true. I'm not going to deny that. But as far as the ideology is concerned, as far as the spread of the extremist ideology is concerned, the challenge is quite significant. So as a counterterrorism analyst or a practitioner, I'm going to be equally exercised by JMB or Neo JMB as I would be with Hizbut Tahrir. Because the ability of groups like Hizbut Tahrir, extremist uh, groups like Hizbut Tahrir, it's proscribed in Bangladesh, but it's a legal entity in many countries. Uh, is as lethal as some of the other groups. Yes, Hizbut Tahrir may not be going out and exploding bombs or killing people directly, but the ideology that they espouse, the literature that they produce, the kind of messages that they disseminate is uh, equally problematic and is equally dangerous for national security. So in the case of Bangladesh, while we are noticing that uh, the major groups that we know are the groups that have existed for a long period of time. While they have been, some of them have been dormant, groups such as Hizbut Tahrir and there are several other smaller outfits as well, have been more vociferous in expounding their ideology. So that is something we also need to worry about. At a wider level, I remain quite concerned by the fact that as geopolitical competition or great power competition has come to the fore, Internationally, we have uh, taken our eye off the ball as far as uh, terrorism is concerned. So there is much uh, less attention on the issue of the threat of terrorism, and there is much less talk about it. I mean, if we look at uh, 10 years ago, we were uh, 
uh, talking a lot more about it. There was a lot more donor interest in this issue. Uh, lots of new projects were being done, but with uh, new issues emerging, particularly in the aftermath of COVID and some of the recent uh, geopolitical tensions and crises that we have seen, the attention has diminished significantly. And that is also a matter of concern because the threat has not gone away. It has not gone away in Bangladesh. It has not gone away in South Asia. It has not gone away anywhere in the world. And the point that, uh, and the purpose of organizing this program today is also to underscore the message that the contours have changed. The contours are changing, but the threat very much remains there. And as the old adage goes, um, as the IRA had famously mentioned that we have to be lucky once, you have to be lucky every time. Because it's just one attack. I mean, if we look back at Holy Bakery, it was one attack which practically shook the entire country. Zafirbhai, you will remember, we met a few days after Holy Bakery at a Gulshan hotel and how morose and deserted the whole environment was. I still remember that night when we were filled with so much horror. And at that point, it seemed that such attacks would be a regular occurrence in Bangladesh. And we are very lucky, thanks to the Almighty and also the efforts of our uh, security forces and law enforcement agencies, that we were able to curtail the threat. But we don't know whether these groups will strike again in a similar manner in future. I really hope not. And I, and there is, I have confidence that we would be able to counter them. But unless we are fully prepared, unless we are fully prepared about, and we are constantly following and evolving, we will not be able to counter the challenge. There is now uh, a lot of literature which suggests that terrorist groups are looking at attacking utility services. There has, of course, been uh, a lot of talk about terrorist groups acquiring capability to carry out attacks using chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons, but that's uh, more or less diminished because of various international measures have been taken. But there are other ways that terrorist groups can attack utility services, such as water supply, uh, the threat of poisoning, and so on, So, which are things that which are very scary. But at the same time, we have to uh, keep in mind that these are threats that we live with and we have to be prepared for them. Uh, COVID-19 has shown us that how one single virus can actually completely uh, destabilize and debilitate the world. So I don't want to be scaremongering, but we have to, uh, in the business, when we are in the business of counterterrorism, we have to deal with grim and often very uncomfortable realities. And one of the realities is that uh, the terrorist groups have also taken note that they can weaponize uh, such bioweapons and they can uh, use it as well. So we have to be very careful when we look at our border security and our safety protocols to deal with these threats. The other threat uh, that in the case of Bangladesh we particularly have to always be concerned with is the threat of simultaneous attacks taking place across the country. So far, we have been fortunate that with the absence of the JMB's uh, 463 explosions across Bangladesh in 2005, we have not really seen attacks taking place simultaneously in various parts of the country. Because terror groups realize that due to the density of population, due to our resource constraints, our ability to uh, honor, deal with or counter simultaneous attacks taking place on the same day in various parts of the country is going to pose a serious challenge. So that is a vulnerability potentially they could also exploit and we have to really re be prepared for that as well. Ultimately, it all boils down to how prepared we are. Because if we are prepared to deal with the changing contours of the threat and if we have an a clearly calibrated action plan where operational and strategic measures are taken in tandem. And if we have a clear understanding of the fact that this is ultimately an ideological and an ideational battle, and we cannot fight it with guns alone, then we will be successful. And Bangladesh is a great example in a way, because I again repeat from where we started in 2015 and 16, because we had several waves in Bangladesh. We had a major wave in the early 2000s. Then there was a bit of a lull. It started again in 2014 and it reached its peak in 2016 and 17. But 
Alhamdulillah, we have been very successful in uh, containing the threat. And not many countries, uh, I must say, have been able to do so. Uh, so it, the onus is on us. The onus is on us to understand the changing tactics that these groups are employing, to understand uh, how we can improve our capabilities, how we can improve our interagency coordination, because that's an area which I think we have to really look at. Uh, and uh, counter the challenge. Another point before I finish, I'm conscious of time, but another point that I would like, particularly like to stress upon is that we have to take a closer and clear look at our counterterrorism response architecture. Because we now have many agencies working on CT and CVE, but there needs to be a greater look at the overarching architecture of uh, the response community. We also need to have a very closer look at what kind of strategies we have in place. Strategies to tackle terrorism, strategies to tackle radicalization, strategies to tackle violent extremism in general, plus operational plans that individual groups will have. I mean, I hear talk in various parts of town about people writing trust strategies or talking about strategies, which is great, but I think there needs to be one comprehensive national strategy. I wrote my master's thesis looking at the counterterrorism strategies of Singapore and Australia. And, if, and I particularly want to highlight those two strategy documents because there each agency's work is very clearly highlighted. And that is the kind of uh, document, that is the kind of plan that we need where each agency would know what their job is and where the one agency's work stops and the other agency's work starts. I also want to stress upon the fact that one of the reasons we have been successful in Bangladesh is due to seamless international cooperation with our partners. And uh, not only partners in South Asia and Southeast Asia, but also partners further afield in various uh, countries of the world, particularly the United States, UK, and Australia. And it is their support which has in, uh, significantly helped us, not only in building our capacity, but also in gathering information and containing the threat. We have to work very carefully on uh, understanding and countering the way terrorist groups communicate and spread their message through the internet and social media. And therefore, there has to be greater collaboration with tech companies. I know the Bangladesh government and various civil society organizations are now working with Meta, uh, but we also have to work with other uh, tech entities or companies uh, because that's where the battle will lie. We also have to uh, find a different role for the armed forces in countering violent extremism. I know one of part of our success story that we have been able to do that it keep it a law enforcement centric effort, and that's the right way forward. But the armed forces, particularly in dealing with the aftermath of attacks, have a major role to play. So therefore, I think it will be quite crucial for us to ensure that the armed forces are also trained and equipped to deal with counterterrorism challenges. And finally, before I close, I want to again stress, which I think has been a mantra that BIPS has been trying to promote for all these years, because we have done a lot of work on city capacity building as well, that ultimately it has to be a whole of government and whole of society approach. It is not the job of the government or law enforcement agencies alone to fight this threat. The citizens have a huge role to play. And I'd like to end with a famous scene by Farid Zakaria, which I think uh, I've always been very moved by this particular adage that the ultimate weapon against terrorism is social resilience. If we are not terrorized, they do not win. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Shavkat. You have given us sufficient food for thought. One key word that I take from your presentation is that the need to evolve and adapt. One of the ways the terrorists survive and thrive is they constantly evolve and adapt. And that is exactly the way a counterterrorism community need to react. We have to be proactive and not reactive. In the context of Bangladesh, it is my personal opinion that our counterterrorism measures have so far been only in the kinetic domain. And that is a wrong approach to go about. 
Operation Terrorism starts with the process of radicalization. And unless we are able to reach that spot, not to radicalize people, we will be seeing bombs on the street at some time or the other. Unfortunately, as Shavka did mention, Bangladesh does not have a counterterrorism architecture. We have several independent capacities and often competing independent capacities who don't talk to each other, don't coordinate and cooperate. And that is a wrong way to approach counterterrorism. One of the best ways of building capacity in counterterrorism is to be self-critical. And in that spirit, I'm mentioning this points. We see great weakness in Bangladesh in the basic understanding of bioterrorism. It is about time we take this seriously. And bioterrorism is something that is coming in the future. We have tremendous gaps and weaknesses in our aviation security. Very recently, a survey done by American agencies gave a negative report on Dhaka Airport, again. And that is a soft spot we must address on an immediate basis. Shavka did mention about utility services. When we interact with different agencies, we see there is a complete lack of understanding of how utility services can be weaponized. Imagine a terrorist group getting access to a water supply source and contaminating it. You'll have mass casualties before you realize anything. And those are some of the techniques that the new groups are going to adopt. I would also like to caution that we are now seeing the tendency of non-explosive and non-weapon utilization for terrorist incidents. So we must be prepared to meet incidents where knife and those kind of weapons are being used or we should be also prepared for mass ramming of crowded places with vehicles and trucks and the likes of that. So the techniques and tactics are constantly evolving. We must be prepared to evolve and adapt. We are yet to see a counter-radicalization strategy in Bangladesh. And we talk about it, but we have not seen anything in concrete shape so far. And that is a priority area for Bangladesh to look at. Other key areas that we shall come and discuss when we come to the Q&A session. But for the time, I would like to turn to our next speaker, Dr. Arash Ashraf. Sorry, you have the floor. <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank Khabibs for inviting me over to this interesting um, talk. Uh, being an academic, I would uh, begin by saying that uh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks have actually uh, brought forth the terrorism discourse at the very forefront of in, uh, intellectual exercise. Uh, <clears throat> so we now see a growing field of study which is called terrorism studies and which has been boosted up uh, in the context of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. So in the, in the broader academic field of terrorism studies, we do see there are two different intellectual streams. One is an uh, orthodox or conventional terrorism studies field which uh, defines terrorism as a non-state activity directed against the state and innocent civilians. And there's an alternative perspective, which is a critical terrorism studies, which um, differs from the conventional way of defining terrorism. And it says that state can also be a terrorist. Uh, there is a disclaimer that in this, I mean, forum, possibly you are taking a conventional terrorism studies route where we agree that uh, terrorism is mostly a non-state activity. So when Shafkat was referring to Daesh or uh, um, General Munizaman was talking about Daesh and the Taliban, basically he was referring to the non-state activities directed against the state. Um, the, the, the other side of the terrorism school of thought that is 
the critical terrorism studies um, where state is also blamed for perpetuating violence and terror. I mean, Myanmar would be the best example. I mean, the way it has terrorized its ethnic minorities and causing a huge displacement uh, would be the perfect candidate for discussion as well. But when you talk about the changing controls of terrorism, we mostly focus on um, uh, sub-state elements, non-state actors, and also transnational networks. Today, I'm going to focus on uh, four different things. First of all, I'll talk a little bit about the global terrorism trends, um, and I rely mostly on the latest Global Terrorism Index report 2022 and share some of the highlights. But then I, 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 I devote substantial uh, amount of my time to talking about three different um, uh, trends in Bangladesh context uh, based on my, my research. One would be crime terror nexus. Uh, second would be the strategies of terrorists and in, in terms of their communication strategies. And thirdly, I'll talk about what General Munir has lastly said that the, the softer approach has been missing, which is basically the, the context of rehabilitation and reintegration of the terrorist offenders. And finally, I touch upon some of the state responses as well. So if you look at the Global Terrorism Index report and see what kind of broader pictures are emerging in terms of the world, we see that uh, um, based on the empirical evidence, the numbers, the data, the quantitative data, it shows that most of the terrorists groups are operating in the world, uh, the, 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 the most importance of them are actually operating in the conflict con context. Uh, so the, the top 10 countries most affected by terrorism are Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, Burkina Faso, uh, Syria, Nigeria, Mali, Niger, and Pakistan, the top 10, in the top 10. And in each of these cases, in each of these cases, what you see is a, is a coexisting you know, terrorist perpetuating in the context of a conflict, right? Uh, and, and we don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that there's a conflict, there has been a conflict going on in Afghanistan since the U.S. invasion in 2001, um, conflict in Iraq since the 2003 invasion, in the Syrian context of the civil war, um, so the ISIS has, has emerged as a, as a potential force there. So we, so there is a conclusion that uh, you know whether it is civil war or international conflict, it creates the context for the terrorist groups to perpetuate. Secondly, it also shows that high-profile terrorist incidents have not completely disappeared. The 9/11 terrorist attacks in 2001, the Bali bombings in 2002, the London bombings in 2005, right? The Mumbai attacks in 2008 would be some of the some of the most high-profile terrorist incidents around the world. We don't see that much attention grabbing and media grabbing incidents, but nevertheless, we see that uh, the number of mass casualty attacks have not completely disappeared, and then data would substantiate it. The GTI index shows that um, the ISK, Islamic State Khorasan province in Afghanistan, was responsible for a single suicide attack in one single attack killed 200,000 people, right? This is kind of, uh, incident. we call it often mass casualty attacks where a large number of people are killed. And if you move to other countries as well, uh, in Niger, Islamic State, West Africa, uh, where gunmen killed 70 people in one incident. So you see diversity in the, in the operational methods and the techniques and the weapons used, whether it is a gun attack or the suicide attack. And also there are single actor terrorism emerging in the scene as General Moon has rightly said that you know, in Paris what happened is a truck rammed into a large crowd of people uh, would, be, would be one thing to, to consider. But, but this is the first time in 1998 in US embassy in Kenya and Tanzania, mm -hmm. right? Uh, vehicle borne explosives were killed, uh, diplomatic premises, you know, attack diplomatic premises and killed people there. Um, then the GTI index, the Global Terrorism Index, also shows that the four deadliest groups in the world are still IS. And I think the report was written before the Taliban victory to, 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 to Kabul, and it, it listed Taliban as well. The JNIM in the Sahel region and Al-Shabaab. So you see that globally, um, the global picture is very different when you compare it with the macro picture in Bangladesh context, because uh, we don't see a conflict uh, driving uh, terrorist uh, phenomena in Bangladesh. So let us now focus on some of the uh, data that I, I generated based on my, my own research in, 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 in Bangladesh context. One thing that I would like to focus is the crime terror nexus. You know, globally, the crime terror nexus is a well-known phenomenon. 
Um, the the conventional wisdom is that criminals and terrorists are completely two different actors. Criminals are profit driven entities, terrorists are politically motivated entities. But you know, terrorists want uh, to establish their own ideologies or their own version of their ideologies in, when they come to state power. Criminals or organized criminals, they, they tend to be underground and they try to make money. But increasingly what you see is a convergence of crime and terror. Terrorists need money so they often go to uh, get involved in crime. And criminals also often need their physical protection, so they get involved with the terrorist activities for self-protection. And, and there are a number of cases we see the convergence of the nexus between crime and terror. Think about ISIS, you know, acquisition of the huge oil fields, right? Smuggling of the oils to generate huge revenues for perpetuating their operations would be one glaring example. In Sri Lanka, in, in our own neighborhood, the Tamils have extensively used different criminal activities to run their operations. Moving to the uh, to the European continent, in, uh, the IRA in, in England, you know, in Northern Ireland, had made extensive use of you know, criminal proceeds to run their operations. The diaspora became one lifeline and, and, and financial line as well. So the crime to the nexus is globally a well-known phenomenon, but in the Bangladesh context, we did an empirical study and our data shows that we did a profiling of 700 militants. Out of the 700 militants, uh, 98 or approximately 14% were found to have some form of nexus. So then we documented like what kind of nexus forming strategies are those. And broadly in the literature, there are three distinct types of nexus forming strategies. Appropriation, cooperation and transformation. Appropriation means when a terrorist will commit the, will appropriate the crime without getting anyone's support, right? So it's, it's like a, a, a terror group will need a uh, smuggled weapon. Rather than relying on a smuggling group, they will go to the border, cross the border, and acquire the weapon and use it for their own purpose. Is a is a case of appropriation. Cooperation. The risk is very high. If you are caught, your whole network can be possibly traced. The second and the safer one is cooperation, uh, which means that you need service and you pay and somebody else will give you the service. So you need to smuggle weapons and explosives, you cooperate with the underground criminals and then they will facilitate it. And there is, it is risky as well. If the criminal is, is arrested and you, 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 you have the risk of getting exposed as well. The third one is a transformation, which means that a terrorist may get involved in crime and eventually you become a criminal and you lose your terrorist identity. So our empirical data shows that, um, that these are revealing numbers. So let's see, let's do some math again. 700 militants are profiled, 98 or less 100 were of them were having some forms of criminal nexus. And then among those 100 people who had nexus, 66% had appropriation, records of appropriation, meaning, uh, and, and global nature it also shows that the you know, crime terror nexus happens mostly because terrorists, they commit the crime, not relying on the other criminals. And it is safer, as I said before. So our data shows that what kind of appropriation happened. It is it's mostly like you know, acquiring arms and explosives in the border areas, uh, getting involved in armed robbery, right? And armed robbery in two different types of places. Uh, commercial places, like uh, in a robbery at a petrol pumps or a jewelry shops, or, or at a private properties, you know, bursting into someone's house and getting money. But this is a mix, you know, this, this nexus, uh, or t which was terrorists committing crime, or the crime terror nexus is, is primarily aimed at fundraising or terrorist financing. Terrorists, you know, money is the life and blood of a terrorist group. When I, when I say terrorism, it is a whole range of activities in, that involves recruitment, radicalization, propaganda, training, operations, post-operations propaganda, uh, transportation, planning for an attack, executing the attack, a whole range of activities are involved. And it is a financial, it is a, it is a, it's a, it requires a whole range of money. So 66% of the terrorists or militants in Bangladesh, you know, in my study shows that they are involved in appropriating crime. 28% cooperation. And, uh, and what kind of, what kind of cooperation did they, did they do and, and for what purposes? So two distinct kind of data emerged. One is um, cooperation with the fake currency producers. 
and the second one is a cooperation with the small arms suppliers right and in, and and and, and there are distinct um, group affiliation in this kind of uh, uh, crime terror nexus data right because let's say uh, Bangladesh government has banned eight different terrorist groups and among the eight four actually have a huge record of uh, getting involved in terrorist attacks OJMB, Huji, Hizbut Tahrir, it's not, not Hizbut Tahrir, Harkatul Zihad al Islami, Huji. The third one is New GMB, that international is known as Islamic States Bangladesh chapter, and Bangladesh government denies it. And the fourth one is Ansar al Islam or Ansar, Ansar al Bangladesh in ABT. Our data shows that uh, these four groups are responsible for approximately 100 plus attacks killing more than 700 people in the last 20 years. So when you say changing contours, being an academic, we look at a broader horizon of roughly 20 years of data to map, to do a mapping of which groups are dominant and how many, how much strengths do they have and what have they done so far. So among the four groups, keep in mind that not all groups have an equal intent to produce huge casualties. Um, some are uh, some in you know, some groups operational strength more indiscriminate attack like bombing would produce indiscriminate casualties. You don't discriminate between a legitimate target and illegitimate target. So OGMB and OGB would be falling into that category, right? Shafkat talked about uh, OGMB's 2005 August 17 attacks, countrywide bombings, 463 explosives he mentioned, right? So 463 explosives planted in in 64 districts of Bangladesh and interestingly the purpose was not to kill people the purpose was to spread the message, the message that uh, they have a, in a GMB had a different ideology to propagate right Hoji was uh, was infamous for uh, popularizing the grenade attacks yeah. right so crude explosives and grenades were the principal uh, operational tactics in the First generation of terrorists, I would say 1999 to 2005. 99 was the time when Udichi blast happened in Jasur. Creating terrorism became a very big, big phenomenon in Bangladesh, but progressively then uh, it ended with the, this phase ended with the, I would say, the JMB's attacks. Then a new phase emerged in 2012, I would say, where we see the AI or Ansar al Islam, but look at the machete is becoming the new norm of the game, right? Chapatis. And and then attack on the shoulders, right? Beheadings, those kind of stuff. But but then move on, moving on to the holy artisan, we saw a combination of elements of suicide terrorism, right? Heavy weapons, small small arms, uh, hostage crisis. You know, it was a hybrid kind of attacks. And and we need to have a much detailed uh, look at all these four groups and their, the history of terrorism to understand or to make sense of the crime terror nexus. Because if you are just using a machete, it is 500 taka to 1000 taka, go to a bazaar and buy it. Versus, versus if you plan to buy an AK-22 or a small gun, right, then it is a few thousand takas proposition, right. And, and also keep in mind, if you, are, if you are hiring someone who is a Monash graduate or a studying undergraduate, right, if you have a diaspora of people coming from Windsor, Kamim Choudhury, right, or Saifullah Ozaki coming from uh, Japan, right, and if, uh, Saifullah Shujon, uh, another ISIS uh, affiliate who went to uh, so, you know, fight as a foreign fighter coming from London, then you also see the, the holy networks getting involved, right, and uh, so that the dynamism of the crime terror nexus is going to be very different. So 66% appropriation, 28% cooperation, only 6% transformation. There's a very negligible number of militants, most all of them belonging to old GMB, were found to be involved in like, you know, snatching away money from Bikash agent, uh, doing some small uh, petty crimes as well, right? And keep in mind, Ashulia bank robbery would be one example, commerce bank robbery, right? So if, if we stick to the official case document data for researchers you know case documents are the gold standard then what you see is that uh, uh, the, rem the remnants the remaining low ranking militants having no connections to their seniors and operational commanders are uh, getting off track right they're losing their ideological dogma and getting attracted to commercial benefits as a result money making uh, ambitions are transforming a very small group of 
um, nature. So, so this is the data. But we also did a social network analysis of the militants, like to see like whether it is the food soldiers getting involved in crime without any direction from the top leader. So there is a strong common common level instruction to do that. And we see you know, different different uh, you know features emerging there. That uh, but it, it doesn't happen in the in the absence of senior level you know military uh, terrorist commanders uh, directions. There is a there is a strong monitoring, there is a strong direction. And in, interestingly, in some cases, militant commanders themselves get involved in the criminal enterprise, especially when, it's, when, it, when, it, when it involves a large amount of only money, getting transferred and receiving it, it is, you know, it is the top leaders. When it is about, uh, you know, uh, distributing the money to different purposes, it is also the top top leaders, and then I'm not getting into all those multi um, uh, detailed data. But the, uh, one, one more thing I would say that our data also shows that 49 percent of the cases, roughly half of the cases, arms and explosive acquisition was the primary motivation for uh, getting involved in crime. So, which means the terrorists get involved in crime as a strategic choice. Keep in mind, in a, committing crime for faith-based extremists is not a good thing for them because there's a moral dilemma. That you are you are fighting a holy war, but then you are getting involved in crime, and it doesn't go go well. So they justify it as a rational for collecting weapons to fight against their enemies. Seventy percent of the nexus happens in the case of robbery, thirteen percent in the case of financial crimes like fake currency, and twenty percent like combination of different purposes. Now moving on to a second research on. Um, Terrorist communications, and uh, and as Shafkat says that uh, we, we see an increasing tendency of the terrorists to operate in the cyberspace. True, but but again, if you take a longer horizon data for time series data for 20 years, then then uh, what you see is that we see three different communication strategies adopted by terrorists. Again, understanding communication strategy of a terrorist group or platform is, is very relevant for law enforcement, intelligence and other operational forces because then you can you can tailor your countermeasures. We see that 59% of the militants and their profiles show that they, they operate, they rely on in-person communication in the real world, talking to each other in a secret place. Nine, only 9% nine only virtual, going to the cyberspace, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, TikTok, not TikTok, actually protected text and there are a few others. 32% mean one third hybrid, they, they, they made both in person and in the virtual world. Making it a very different and complex phenomenon, but if you look at the timeline, you see that since 2015, this phenomenon of uh, terrorists going online in Bangladesh context has increased. Pre-2015 data shows that they mostly relied on on um, on the real world communication rather than the virtual world communication. And, and our data shows striking similarity with the global trends. Globally, you also see that it's you know see think about the the sharp difference between Al Qaeda as a transnational network versus ISIS as a transnational network, right? I mean, the only case where Bin Laden was uh, making mal you know extensive use of this this broadcast. Right, uh, video messages being spread up, but 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 I think you would agree that uh, that uh, Al Qaeda operatives had mostly communicated in the real world versus ISIS uh, made extensive uh, uh, communications in the in the virtual world. Uh, and also, we see group variations. Right, the four groups I mentioned in Bangladesh context, OJMB and OG, were mostly relying on real world communication. By contrast, new GMB and AI or ABT mostly relied on the virtual communication, the hybrid one. So, we see a generational difference as well. Now, then our study looked into like, uh, you know, why do terrorists communicate with each other? And, 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 and communication between whom? The top and the bottom of the a senior coterie of terrorist leaders communicate mostly with them. And there are distinct features that emerge. We see the terrorists communicate for a whole range of purposes, as I said before, recruitment, radicalization, training, fundraising, operational planning, executing operations, and post operative uh, operations publicity. Meaning, you know, their operations doesn't end at the spot where somebody is killed or injured. They also now want to publicize it as much as possible uh, to, 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 to get more attention, to draw more, more recruits as well. 
When you look at what kind of social media, our frequency uh, distribution shows that Facebook has been the most preferred platform for uh, group discussions and generating ideas and also attracting uh, you know, people and to radicalize people, followed by Telegram, Threema, Protected Text, and Chat Secure. These are some of the key platforms. Um, security features of the social media, terrorists or militants are also strategic. They, they make an extensive assessment of which social media is more secure than the others. They go for the more secure options and avoid the less secure options. When, when, when they do an assessment of the security features, they look for end-to-end -end encryption. I send you a message and nobody else is going to see it. And there are self-destructive message features as well, right? Somebody reads it and then it auto, you know, destroyed after a few seconds. You have to choose that option. Um, and you see that this, uh, these, these are data from Bangladeshi militants. And then, then if you Google search and you find that ISIS has also made a security feature assessment. And then they have a, you know, uh, Wall Street Journal has a nice uh, image of uh, uh, which social media is perceived to be more secure by the ISIS. Right? So what we're talking here is the militants are not crazy guys. They are very strategic actors. Dealing with them is a counter strategy. Challenges, so what are the key challenges of dealing with terrorist communication? The first challenge is detection. Detecting who's communicating with whom in what platform and for what purpose. Next would be interception, right? Detection is done, done, but for, for an operational effective decision, it's important to get the guy at the right moment intercepting the person and also the third challenge is intelligence analysis right we, we can you can arrest x y and z but we need to look for patterns whether x and y and z are connected to each other and whether this connection is mainly for fundraising for chatting or for doing something much bigger then the third um, theme that i wanted to focus is uh, rehabilitation and reintegration of violent extremist offenders and here I have to tell you one thing, that um, that my understanding and my data and my interactions with the uh, members of the security and intelligence agency show that Bangladesh has for up until a few years ago, right, hard power has been the dominant approach to dealing with uh, terrorism. Hard power is talking, is we define, academics define hard power as a brute force. So arresting someone, arresting a suspect, putting that suspect into jail, expecting maximum punishment for that person is part of hard power as well because you want to punish the offenders right in worst case scenario use of lethal force or gun power is involved as well right we see holy artisan where uh, brute force have been used for uh, defeating the militants or to you know and uh, and if you look at uh, open source data you will also see that the ctdc has carried out a few dozen high risk operations in different places of Bangladesh, right, where uh, where force were used, casualties are produced, right. So these are the hard power stories. But then there is a growing recognition that we need to have a soft power approach as well. Now, what is the soft power? And globally, I mean, Singapore would be the best example where there is a very strong and well well designed uh, terrorist rehabilitation program there. What is terrorist rehabilitation? Basically, it, I didn't. It recognizes that that uh, think about if if our prison system has roughly 1000 to 1500 people right under trial rates say 80 percent 20 percent convicts those people who are convicts maybe some of them are, are getting death sentence right maybe out of out of 200 people maybe let's say 20 people will be getting death sentence but 180 people will be getting out of the jail after 10 years 15 years or 20 years so will we give them a second chance to be rehabilitated and to be normal citizens or do we want them to be remaining uh, terrorists you know in the when they come out of the jail the recognition the growing recognition that people need a second chance right and also you know you need to you need to de-radicalize their minds and hearts and then to make sure that they can be also peace ambassadors it's called for the second you know has called for a new approach which is a softer approach so now we see a new realization among the bangladeshi uh, security services and, and the actors that uh, that rehabilitation can be a viable strategy for bangladesh as well we do not have any systematic approach but there are peaceful approaches different agencies have uh, organized events where militants surrendered their arms right? they surrendered to the law enforcement agencies and they were given some financial supports 
But but the fundamental difference between the Bangladeshi ad hoc approach and the global approach to rehabilitation is that we have primarily relied on an economic support approach that we thought that giving some financial support would be sufficient to demotivate them. But the global standard, like referring to Global Counterterrorism Forum, GCTF has a global uh, standards uh, setting uh, template that a rehabilitation involves, uh, you know, with the psycho psychoreligious and psychosocial counseling, right? Talking to someone and understand the faith or the ideology or the dogma that one has and provide counseling to 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 de-radicalize that person but but in the first place you need to have a security screening procedure you need to have a, uh, a risk assessment and a screening process and an admission criteria which means that not everyone is going to be eligible to participate in a rehab program some people are too risky to be enrolled so a risk assessment is needed but who is going to do the risk assessment there are specialized security and intelligence agencies whose domain and expertise in, in risk assessment and secondly you have to do an admission criteria setting the criteria that well if somebody has xyz criteria they can be enrolled into the rehab programs then you have to have a screening process but it's a multi-stakeholder process because if, if we are talking about prison based rehabilitation then the prison authority authority has to have a have to realize and recognize that it is a viable strategy and they have to cooperate with the law enforcement and other actors outside of the jail. Right. And then the, the next question would be who is going to provide the security to the, to the to the rehabilitation service providers because you need counselors to go into the jail system. Right. And then get out and have their own lives. So how will privacy of the service providers be ensured? Right. And how and 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 then there's a whole range of uh, concerns. Then, if, then, 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 interestingly, global literature in the Singaporean case and other also shows that uh, if militants do not have the do not have the requisite uh, levels of skills and education, then then skills training and education pro services should be there as well for, for available for them. So that once they get out of the jail, there has they should be uh, qualified enough to be absorbed in the job market. Right, and then family has to be forthcoming as well. Community needs support. These need a paradigm shift because our current paradigm is a hard approach. You arrest someone, right? Collect the evidence to get maximum punishment. And if somebody does not surrender, then you use brute force. So interestingly, the definition of hard power is needs to be redefined as well because it is much harder to understand the psyche and, and provide a counter narrative to the indoctrinated person. That is even much harder, right? All right, then, then, then I'm at the last part. The big question is, so what? Right? What does my data from crime terror nexus, terrorist communication and violent extremist offenders rehabilitation tell us about the required responses from the government and, and the partners, development partners? We do understand that uh, the primary responsibility for fighting terrorism and dealing with militancy lies with the government. At the end of the day, people will not, you know, we can't be responsible for, we can't be held responsible for a terrorist incident happening in X, Y, Z place. So law enforcement and intelligence is the first line of defense in a democracy, right? But, uh, but armed forces have a role to, to deal with it in worst case scenario. Like see that Atiyah Mohal or Holy Artisan would, would be the right, right uh, case, cases to be mentioned. And, and, and what we are talking perhaps is that there is a need for a well-articulated counter-terrorism strategy where the responsibility uh, of each stakeholder needs to be clearly defined so that uh, duplication of efforts does not occur. And General Munir has talked about that uh, there are some levels of duplication of where we do see different uh, agencies having CT capacities, counter-terror capacities. As an academic, I would say it's absolutely normal because we see government agencies as bureaucratic entities and bureaucratic competition is a very normal thing. You, we have to live with this. But I would, I'm optimistic that they're saying that uh, Bangladesh is trying to develop some coordination mechanisms to, to avoid this duplication efforts and to improve our interagency coordination. The two agencies, the two, two coordination um, efforts I would, I would like to measure and based on the open source data. One is the NCIC, National Committee for Intelligence Coordination, which was uh, established in 2009 after the BDR mutiny and which was formalized through a gadget notification in 2019. Gadget notification is a primary data, is an open source data. And, uh, and, and, and uh, what is the problem is that in a, 
you know, Western democracy have data regarding the meeting minutes of the of the committees. So at least, you know, a sanitized version is available so that people know that the committee meets and there are some threats assessment coming from the highest level of the state. What is pr the problem with us is that we are in a complete blackout about how often does the committee meet, what is being discussed, what does the committee, in the committee's assessment, what is, well, look at the UK's, uh, you know, SIS website, they do have a threat assessment, threat levels are defined, people do get to know what is, and we are relying on these think tank platforms to know what are the threat assessment, right? So we don't have any official channel of communication and declassification as well. I think that is where we, we should head towards slowly. We have another committee called National Committee for Security Affairs. Both committees are actually headed by the Prime, Honorable Prime Minister and the heads or the DGs of different uh, law enforcement, intel and security agencies sit there and and uh, they also have a role to play in defining the threats understanding the threats assessing the threats and defining the responses as well so i would say that being optimistic that well we do have some efforts to coordinate the activities and the roles of different stakeholders what is missing is that there is no publicly available version of what they do and how they assess the threat and what responses are being made and again uh, i agree with the panelists that uh, countering terrorism is not the only responsibility of the state the non-state actors need to come forward uh, academics have a role to play to make sure that we 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 do uh, spread the knowledge of peace include you know Peaceful tolerance and inclusive society is something that we need, and it is us who have a big role to play. Media has a big role to play. Civil society and NGOs have a big role to play. And I think a whole of society approach or a comprehensive approach actually is something that that requires. But a strategy would be something that define the roles of various segments of the society. My understanding is that um, it is not that we don't have any strategy. I think it is either ad hoc or unwritten, or it is coming from their practices. But uh, looking at the global best practices, the United States has an official counter-terrorism strategy. UK has a contest. Uh, Singapore has a white paper. So, you know, some countries have something written. So that a written document clearly defines the responsibilities and helps avoid the duplication of efforts. It is a South Asian culture, perhaps, that we don't either formulate an official strategy or if we formulate, we don't publish it. Right. So I think that uh, maybe we, we need to rethink whether, and I think, that, and I'm optimistic that we should have a strategy maybe in the next few years and definitely make it public so that the people will be convinced that we do have something to share with the people. I conclude here and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Ashraf for your very rich database intervention. We are much educated with your research works. Before I turn to the Q&A session, I would also like to share some areas of concern that I see myself as a student of the subject. You did mention that we don't have strategies. We, in fact, don't have any strategies on counterterrorism. All we have is individual organizations acting on their own and sometimes they become counterproductive because they nullify one another. Second is not enough attention is now being paid to the process of revitalization of AQIS. We see definite trends where AQIS is getting revitalized under a new leadership. And when that happens, the threat perspective in Bangladesh will change, and it is changing. I see that there is tremendous weakness in the context of Bangladesh, and also in other countries, on terror financing. The money is still getting in. And as long as the money gets in, the groups will survive and thrive. A critical area for us to look is the space for NRBs, non-resident Bangladeshis, how their money flows into Bangladesh. BIPS has done a year-long study with a group of people, a group of NRBs in a foreign capital, and we came back with very disturbing results. The money does get into Bangladesh and goes into wrong hands. Another 
critical area to look at is the state of our migrant workers. The process of radicalization of our migrant workers is quite high. We have had several incidents in different places, including in a very tightly monitored society like Singapore, where we have had serious cases of migrant radicalization and going up to the point of operational planning. Dr. Ashraf did give us an idea about Bangladesh's effort for rehabilitation. But the first thing that I would like to point out is that our prisons are becoming centers of radicalization. We have got no practical monitoring mechanism or de-radicalization efforts in our prisons. So in the absence of that kind of an effort in our prison system, rehabilitation really cannot take roots. I would like to mention very categorically that the process of rehab is a very, very extremely expensive. It has to be laid out very carefully and it is intensive both in terms of manpower and money. I don't see any efforts in those directions in Bangladesh. We hear about some rehab strategies being written at different places, but I would say that incoherent strategies are even more harmful than no strategies. If we do the wrong kind of rehab, we'll be only sinking in money in the wrong direction. Rehabs are supposed to be done by specialists, not by generalists. It needs a very different kind of approach, starting from the prison, going back into the family and into the society. I cannot share with you empirical data, but our studies have indicated that most of our return prison inmates who get out of the prison are recycled back into the terrorist cycles again. And not because they want to, but they're forced to. Because when a radical or a terrorist gets out of the prison, he has to give a monthly subscription to the police just to survive. So if that is the kind of a state, then it is much safer for him to get back into the terror cells again. So we have to be self-critical in analyzing where we exactly stand in our counter-terrorism efforts and strategies. I'm very happy to see that we have a number of experts in this room, and therefore we would like to hear your opinions so that we can educate ourselves and enrich our knowledge. The floor is now open. Please ask your questions, give your comments, anything that you want to say. I'm currently working at Mumbai uh, Aviation University. So first of all, I'd like to thank both the speakers. They have covered the field in an extensive manner and they have virtually addressed every issue on point with regard to terrorism. Um, so that's why I won't just ask you a question, but my point is that from my own experience that I'll tell, why is it that we don't have a strategy? One of the main reasons that uh, we as a nation are oral, traditionally oral. You find so many documents in the Western world, it is only because they go by the written word and we go by the oral word. This is in fact, this is the basic problem with us, that we don't want to write down anything. We have fought a brilliant, um, brilliant war of independence of about nine months and we don't have a good history book a good history research document written by any of the Bangladeshi scholars. This is the big problem that we have to address with regard to combating terrorism. We have to have a document. And whose responsibility is this? This is the responsibility primarily, I personally feel, is the academicians. Because the academy, an academician is more inclined and uh, better placed in writing a document after conducting the research work like Dr. Ashraf has done, conducting the research work with the other intelligence agencies or apparatus. 
since we do not write anything, that's why you do not also have a very viable deterrence strategy because we do not know exactly what we have to do in case of an uh, encroachment into our uh, land territory. Uh, this is first point. I will just tell you from my own experience that when I was working as the chair of the Civil Aviation Authority of Bangladesh, we did a little bit of uh, research work with Dr. Ashraf on aviation security. And he would bear me out because, because everybody is interested, all the intelligence agencies or the other departments are interested in taking over the aviation security business, but nobody was interested in writing a document for that. So what does it mean? It means that we are unable to cope with things which require academic and intellectual panache. That we have to accept, and as Abir's president says, that we have to be self-critical and we have to be self-critical. Unless we are self-critical, we'll only find that we are talking here and there without having conducted proper search work and without having placed the proper documents so that everybody knows whose job is what. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jansahir, here, you have the floor. Jansahir, uh, former Commandant National Defense College, Bangladesh. It was an excellent exposition of micro-level terrorism and uh, counter-terrorism in context of Bangladesh. Uh, I thank both the keynote speakers for that. But I think we have not dealt with the subject comprehensively. Uh, I think that the world is far, far away from dealing with the root causes. And who creates the context for this terrorism? Just yesterday, President Joe Biden spoke so uh, passionately, strongly against uh, conduct of referendum for the Donbas region. And he said that such an accession will are not acceptable. But when an accession and such things were going on in Palestine since 1948, the Golan Heights were annexed, East Jerusalem has been annexed, and every day a piece of real estate in, in Palestine annex. Where are the voices of these guardians of the world? If you have this dichotomous, this hypocritic situation, we can really suppress terrorism, but can we really end terrorism? And this is, so we are lopsided in our approach um, about comprehensively dealing with this phenomenon of terrorism. Because the, the sources or states or interests that really creates terrorism in the world, we are far, far away from tackling this. And who is going to uh, make the guardians of the world behave righteously in order that this, this phenomena is in the long term is killed? Response from the two speakers, please. Thank you very much, sir. I'm Dr. Zaid Khan. Uh, retired group captain from Bangladesh Air Force, currently affiliated with uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Aviation and Aerospace University. Uh, I will pick up two particular thoughts that was highlighted by uh, Shafkat, the distinguished uh, research fellow at BIPS, is this, we need to take a long view. And his emphasis on uh, idea, that it's essentially an ideational battle. And then uh, the question actually then comes to about building on soft power elements, which was highlighted by Dr. Ashraf. Uh, but uh, um, my question probably relates, uh, is aligned with what General Jahir was currently saying. Bangladesh, as a reader of international relations, I will put this long view from an international relations perspective. Bangladesh is situated in a, uh, in a just strategic position where we have a state a scenario state where the chief minister provokes or uh, makes statements or takes policy which sort of intimidates a certain section of the people, particularly the Muslims, and also uh, surrounded by another country which persecutes uh, Rohingyas who are mostly Muslims. In that context, how do you create uh, 
how do you take a long view? Uh, because the social, uh, this ideational battle is interpretive. As a Muslim living in this country, how does this society interpret their existence in that particular context um, from an international relations perspective? That how would they be, uh, how, how they would see their future uh, living in this society uh, when this uh, Saffron or Joy Srinam movement is creating momentum? Not, I'm not suggesting that there is no moderate voice in that country also. There is a considerable opposition to that as well. But how do you strategize those elements which are present and the changing contours in the ideational element of terrorism? How do you strategize our foreign policy, our interactions with the neighbors, taking into consideration these changing contours, of ideational ch changing contours, um, into our, so, so that we, we make a society which is more tolerant. I still believe Bangladesh is probably one of the, uh, is, the is the powerhouse of liberal values in the subcontinents uh, still. But how do you remain that? So that would be my question to the panelists here. Thank you. My name is Aisha Kabir. I'm with Prothaman of the newspaper. So uh, I just have a question for Dr. Ashraf. You were mentioning about state terrorism as in Myanmar where they're aggressively uh, violent against the citizens. But I was thinking of about state terroris terrorism in a more passive, aggressive form and how that could affect or give rise to radicalization. Say in a country, maybe Bangladesh, where there is democracy in name, but we see that you know people are being suppressed, not being allowed to speak, not being allowed to act. So under that, especially the youth, when they're being suppressed, attacked by other youth, not being allowed to speak, think, or do anything which they want to do independently. So with this lack of democratic space, lack of freedom of expression, lack of uh, freedom of speech, could that also be, uh, you know, lead people to uh, radicalization? So could that be a sort of defined as a sort of passive, aggressive terrorism? This lack of democratic space, which could also lead to radicalization. Thank you, General Shahid. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, thank you very much for the update on this uh, terrorism and counterterrorism. Uh, after seeing for the last twenty plus years and also Americans spent $2 trillion uh, on counterterrorism and terrorism. I think it's time to send this terrorism, counterterrorism to the drawing board once again, because it's, there are so much contradiction in this one, defining who is terrorist and who is not, and what is the counterterrorism policy, and how to deal with this. Uh, the resultant is that this kind of particular counterterrorism has destroyed many countries around the world, number one. When I see that uh, Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization, while on the other side, RSS of India and KKK of uh, US is not terrorist uh, organization. Similarly, there's a lot of, this list is big. Then what happened to those um, 800 uh, prisoners in Guantanamo Bay? Have you ever heard that uh, they were prosecuted uh, Till today, I, mean, I haven't seen any prosecution or I mean uh, anything done to them. What happened to them? Now, coming to the home front, this so-called terrorism, counter-terrorism has really disseminated some of our social fabric. One of them is, as Madame has uh, rightly said, that it has stopped uh, rather giving any space to the youths and other um, uh, to discuss or to have think of uh, or, uh, or uh, rather express the opinion. Just imagine a young boy who's uh, like, we are all young boys, who's supposed to be uh, running after girls and with love letters, what not. And he's taking a decision in holy artisan, go for the extreme thing. Have we learned anything from there? We haven't. We even don't know what has motivated that boy to go there and do such thing. So this is the high time, I think, we should send this one, terrorism, counter-terrorism, to the drawing board and find out how best we can deal with it. Please, be remember, please do remember that this particular 
we can see or alternative opinions will remain in future also but it doesn't mean that we go we have to kill them we catch them and de-radicalize them listen to them and find out what is their uh, my point of contention like one of the thing you uh, have just uh, mentioned that his no tahari this go i mean if you talk to them you'll be horrified to listen to these guys they are highly educated guys and they have got the degrees they have got you'll be horrified also but when you listen to them you don't have any counter argument with them and this is the fine this is the thing we have to decide how to counter argument uh, present them with a counter uh, uh, narrative which will actually um, uh, bring them out of this uh, extremism or whatever uh, you call thank you very much we'll now like to go to our young friends from the university and i really want to hear you or hear your opinion or ask a question my greetings to everyone no, no, present no, in the room no 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 uh, yes and gratitude to the wonderful uh, discussions by the discussants i'm fairly inexperienced i'm a student at the university of dhaka and majoring in criminology and my question is uh, from um, chakat munir sir's uh, discussion when he was talking about 2016 when terrorism actually peaked during specifically during the blogger killings when i was reading into um avijit troy's murder case for example and there was this case where uh, his wife won mohammed was a victim but she was never called to stand and there was a very public uh, battle i would say in articles where she was said that she wasn't approached and the ios were saying she, uh, they tried to contact her but they couldn't even get him so in a country where we don't have a witness protection act where we'd have no clarity over why a victim of such a direct incident a public incident wasn't even brought to stand or contacted properly how can we ensure accountability or how do we evolve from here since you were talking about evolving and self um criticism and reflection on us thank you thank you thank you very much that's a very good question Uh, greetings to everyone. I'm Nuga Jannat Tumishra and uh, I'm majoring my master's degree from University of uh, Dhaka in Criminology. So uh, more than about the discussion, not like a question, but uh, I'm here to share my opinion about one thing. Uh, there is uh, said that in some part of the country, the uh, defamation of terrorism uh, was uh, somehow biased seem like that uh, in one country the uh, characteristic of uh, terrorism to define that is very different from other parts of the world so if uh, that in that case to uh, then how do you follow the same strategy to counter the terrorism thank you thank you if there are any other questions before yes darin Uh, hello everyone i am tarin and i am currently working uh, as an assistant professor in bangladesh university of professionals and i teach international relations uh, i am very thankful to both of the, both these uh, experts for uh, bringing so much uh, uh, new ideas in front of us and for sir presenting empirical data also uh, i'll be very brief uh, i have one question to shafkat muni sir um, regarding although you have uh, or we have seen that there has been a lot of uh, uh, there have been a lot of developments in, in case of uh, uh, countering terrorism but still uh, there are cases uh, of radicalization which we saw during the visit of prime minister modi in bangladesh uh, and um, i'm not sure why uh, the intelligence agencies uh, are actually failing in in apprehending such situations and uh, and also the rise of taliban and also uh, due to in in last 2 3 years we have seen a lot of uh, 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 threats of radicalization or terror in rohingya refugee camps also so we still have a lot of threats to uh, take care of but why uh, what is actually uh, we all agree to the fact that we we don't have long term strategy but what are the actual uh, reasons that we still don't have that long term strategy Or why the government is not still, or what is the fact that uh, that is stopping the government from taking such long-term strategy? And uh, is there any specific intelligence-related 
progress we have made since the uh, Malay artisan uh, attack. And I have uh, one question to uh, Sir also. Um, you have uh, told about the crime terror nexus. Uh, do you think, since we see securitization of uh, refugees in different countries, do you think it is a time for us also to think that more seriously? Because uh, we have been seeing uh, cases of uh, terror in Rohingya refugee camps. Uh, uh, more than 50 people, I think, have been killed in those camps in last three, three years. And those groups like Munna Bahini or Arsa or other, there are more than 14 groups groups, I think, uh, operating in those uh, camps. And they are also uh, using different tactics like uh, gold smuggling, arms smuggling, kidnapping, human trafficking. So do you think um, uh, we can uh, fall them in the category of crime to nexus and we need to think about those issues more uh, uh, carefully? The government need to uh, take care of those things? Uh, yeah, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Zia from one of the intelligence agency. Sir, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I think it's, it has been uh, comprehensive. comprehensive. However, uh, one thing I think when they sing, one issue that is uh, covered by this uh, uh, the last speaker about the Rohingya issues, I think and there, one of the uh, special part that is state-owned terrorism. State-owned terrorism has been done to the Rohingyas. At the same time, sending them to other country, a state-owned another terrorism to the, uh, has been done to another state, that is Bangladesh. We are seriously facing this uh, trouble. And uh, I would like to remind everyone, especially the world community, the world is a global village now. So nobody is safe from uh, any of them. And they are very much subject of interest for any of the group they want to recruit them. So I think uh, we should also keep focusing on them. And when their justice can be ensured, I think the root of terrorism will be uh, uprooted. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, yes, please, you had a point. I just wanted to add to her and some other speakers. What is the thin red line in religious discourse? That if you cross this, then you are into the domain of terrorism. Because in Bangladesh, we have seen that. That people have been arrested for having a book of hadith. And, and, and this sort of small pretty things. So the, we are, the guardians now are confused as to what sort of religious education are they going to impart to their children. So there is no sort of prescription about it. So where, where you are crossing the line, and this has not been really defined. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm talking in particular about Islam. And, 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 and so this is another aspect which we are trying to spell out in our country. And unless we do so as parents and as young parents, would be parents, I think they'll be in great, what I would say, um, in dilemma as to what sort of religious education they will impart to their children. I was ne I, my mother, father was very religious. I was never radicalized with my religious education. Why are the people today getting radicalized? So where is the line? So I think I think I will ask the professor to really uh, take this question. Thank you, sir. I'm Nafis Mahan Kobo. I'm completing my honors graduation from University of Dhaka, Department of Criminology. Uh, thank you guys for your uh, tremendous presentation. Uh, we have uh, a li very little concept about offender treatment in our country, and also we are holding 3.5 times higher convicts than our capacity. Uh, and here we have terrorists who have been isolated completely before their recruitment and also went through a process which we call brainwash. Uh, will the mass people of our country accept the rehabilitation program of them and will they welcome them in the society after the process? 
We will now turn back to our speakers for their answers and comments. We will start with you, Shabdat. Uh, thank you. Very rich set of questions and interventions, and I mean, I think we have learned a lot. I will start with the uh, first point that was made by Group Captain Zahid. Uh, Bangladesh faces a very difficult situation at the moment. It is, I also like to think that we are a powerhouse of liberal ideas in the region, in an increasing, in a region where liberal ideas are increasingly diminishing. But uh, we are in a particularly difficult situation because on one hand we have a country to our southeast which is essentially defined by uh, a single ideology where anyone from another faith or identity is persecuted. And I think uh, we don't need to look very far but just to look at the Rohingya genocide. On the other hand, we have another country which uh, is our bigger neighbor, which was always uh, held up as a model for democratic, liberal ideas, pluralism, secularism, and so on, which is going through a very difficult point at the moment where uh, major societal changes are taking place which not only places that country at risk, but also poses a risk for the wider region as well. And I think uh, that is something we have to uh, tackle. It is easy, uh, sometimes very difficult to talk about this in Bangladesh, and our uh, neighbors often get very uh, upset if we point these things out. But this is, uh, I think, from the government as well, this has been pointed out too that we uh, cannot be an island of secularism and pluralism and liberalism when we have uh, competing ideologies gaining prominence in either of these two countries. So that's a challenge we will have to face. And uh, we need to have more open discussion about this within our society on how we can preserve our ideals, how we can preserve our liberal values while uh, we are also seeing major changes taking place in these two countries. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion here about root causes and some of the challenges. The world has never been a just place. Uh, we should stop thinking that the world has ever been a just place or the world will ever be a just place. Certain causes, certain issues will always gain more prominence because that's the reality of life. Um, but having said that, uh, the issues that we are talking about are not only related only to these root causes, I mean, they're very important because we, I mean, the Israel-Palestine issue will always be at the forefront and unless we achieve some full solution to that, a, a proper equitable solution, the terrorists and extremist groups will continue to exploit this issue. I mean, we, there's no better way to explain it. And then that is something that everybody now recognizes, but un unfortunately, we see very little forward movement and that's a major challenge for us. But at the same time, uh, there are lots of other issues which are also being brought to the fore by the, these groups. And I would agree with the participants that uh, while we counted them, we must also try to understand how these groups use these issues to their advantage and why they bring it to their recruitment, their ideological exposition and so on. And there needs to be conversations about those as well. Uh, the chair has earlier mentioned about AQIS. And uh, that is a group that we really need to uh, look into because it has regional ambitions. It, not, it, it, it is a group which wants to look at the entire region. And these groups are often emboldened by uh, incidents which take place in our region, which adds further impetus to the ideology that they want to expound. We also have a serious challenge in front of us in the sense that uh, there is also a constant criticism that we are singling out Islamist militancy alone. And that's a criticism that we have to tackle. And one of the points that I wanted to highlight in my remarks alone, that we are not only dealing with Islamist militancy alone anymore. Perhaps that might have been the case 20 years ago. But there are uh, extremist tendencies of groups, from groups in countries uh, where other faiths are dominant and that the, we need to look at those groups as well. For example, Buddhist extremism in Southeast Asia is now a major challenge. And not just uh, in Southeast Asia, we have the Bodo Balasena in Sri Lanka, uh, we have um, the 969 in Myanmar, we have similar groups in Thailand. 
and their anti-Muslim uh, rhetoric, their anti-Muslim ideology is uh, incendiary and it causes a lot of problems and we can draw links to the Rohingya genocide as well as some of the perpetrators were also motivated by this ideology. And then there is a uh, need for us to talk more about that as well. I'm very glad to see that internationally, especially under the new administration in Washington, there is now greater talk about Rimvi or racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism or colloquially speaking what is often referred to as white supremacist uh, extremism because we need to have those conversations. Because ultimately, as I would uh, continue to harp on the point that it's an ideational battle, and when we draft uh, an alternative or a counter-narrative, or when you sit down with a militant, these are the questions that they would pose to you. So I think we have to be very careful that we, when we talk about terrorism and militancy, we are very clear in pointing out that it's not just Islamist militants, but it's religious political militancy drawing or misinterpreting different faiths, not just one faith. I think that's very important. Going to uh, Tarim's point, I think it was a very interesting uh, point that Tarim raised. I think the issue is uh, we have come uh, a long way in the last uh, 10 years to be more precise, and uh, post-2016 in particular. But creating new structures, creating new uh, methods, particularly when it comes to identifying threats or countering threats, takes time. And you're right, uh, there have been cases where we were not able to identify the threats in advance, or we were not able to tackle them uh, with the kind of expeditiousness that we would have liked. But that's a part of the whole learning process that Bangladesh has to go through. The more critical thing here is that we have to be self-critical. I know uh, we have a tendency in Bangladesh often to get upset if there is any form of criticism about any of our policies, but that's not the right approach. Uh, our job as think tanks, or your, uh, if we uh, look at you as an academic or Professor Ashraf as an academic, or for those of us from the think tank and policy community, our job is to help the state in finding these solutions. But no diagnosis or help is possible until you have actually been critical about some of the challenges that you have, and that's where the conversation needs to start. Uh, we have so far been very fortunate, and I have spoken on this uh, issue to the media a few times in the recent past, that we have so far been very fortunate that we have not had major radicalization issues within the Rohingya camps. And they have now been here for five years, but unless the international community helps us in finding a solution, and if these people continue to remain here for the foreseeable future, there is no guarantee that large-scale radicalization will not take place. We have a large number of people who have complete hopelessness. We have a large number of people, uh, people who came here at the age of 13, they're now reaching adulthood, and there is no future. We talk about uh, sending them back, but sending them back has to be based on uh, peaceful, voluntary repatriation, and where there should be a guarantee that they would not be persecuted once they go back. I have been to Myanmar. Personally, I've been to Napido, I've been to Yangon. I have interacted with various uh, outfits there, groups there. And uh, uh, the kind of discrimination that people face if they're not Bamar Buddhists in that country is galling. I mean, uh, I would encourage everybody to look at this issue a bit more, uh, in a bit more detail. But unless those reforms and changes take place in Burmese society, sending these people back is also not going to be an immediate solution. So. We really need to work with the international community. We really need to work with Myanmar. I still think we need to work with Myanmar. We really also need to work with Myanmar's friends, countries that Myanmar rely on, to actually find a solution. Because you're absolutely right that unless uh, we tackle this issue, the Rohingya uh, camps could potentially become a major challenge for us as well. And going back to our friend from Dhaka University, your question about uh, witness protection. Yes, that's a very uh, important point that you have raised. We have to have better witness protection measures. We have to uh, have better opportunities for people to reach out to state agencies without facing any problems in future. Because ultimately, if the state does not get information from the community, how will it come to the threat? If I, as an individual, as a citizen, notice something nefarious in my neighborhood, and if I'm not able to adequately report it to the police and alert them, they won't be able to act. 
But for that, a culture of trust, a cult uh, confidence building is required. And I'm glad you brought that because the Obijit uh, Roy murder case is a very good example how. And we have to start, uh, look at some of those lackings that we have. I'll finish by saying that uh, our objective of this particular roundtable, and we'll continue to look at this issue uh, in future, and we are constantly talking to the media about this. Our objective is ultimately to help the state and the government of Bangladesh find and fine tune some of these issues. And for that, we have to be very objective in our stock taking. We have to be very objective in understanding our capabilities and weaknesses, and we all have to work together. We have come a long way. Let me again belabor on that point that we have come a long way, but the threat is constantly evolving. And if we can't take the long view and constantly update ourselves, we will again face challenges in the future. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Your replies, please. Um, I think we have got uh, quite a good number of interesting questions and comments. Um, uh, let me begin by agreeing with uh, um, Air Force Marshal retired. Uh, Mahmoud was saying that uh, we are the oral nation and and then thus we prefer talking a lot more and writing less and hence there is a lack of uh, written strategy uh, uh, strategy for countering terrorism or even an aviation security strategy um, the two comments one from uh, General Zahir and Ms. Aisha Kabir uh, actually I would like to answer the question uh, by referring to both of your questions or comments actually. General Zahir, you mentioned that uh, you know when the world is criticizing the Russian annexation of let's say you should Donbush while uh, remaining silent on the Israeli occupation and annexation of the Palestinian territories and then it's a double standard and possibly this can feed into the extremist narratives and uh, and Ms. Aisha Kabir, your, your question is like when the youth uh, see the lack of democracy and freedom of speech uh, would that uh, contribute to radicalization? And interestingly, if we look at the two generations of violent extremist offenders in Bangladesh, when I say two generations, first generation I refer to Huji and, and GM, old GMB, and the second generation I refer to new GMB and, uh, and AI or ABT. If you look at the uh, charge sheet documents or the, or the extremist narratives uh, uh, published in the media, then you see that Interestingly, the extremist narratives uh, regarding their process of radicalization refers to domestic and external sources of ideas. Domestically, they do refer to uh, lack of democracy. It, it, it is not a regime-specific uh, discussion of lack of democracy because when you look at the GMB's leaflets published in 2005, right, and Shaikh Abdul Rahman produced a handwritten leaflet which was uh, distributed in the in the packets of explosives, right? Those refer to different kinds of misgovernance in the society, lack of justice, uh, absence of democracy. And they were trying to uh, delegitimize the existing governance system as a, as a means to justify their own brand of ideology. Now, if you look at the same kind of narratives uh, from the uh, recent arrestees, right from new gmb or ai and you see the same narratives of misgovernance is cited as a source of their radicalization they also they also bank on the global narratives of muslim victimization referring to palestine referring to kosovo referring to kashmir referring to rohingya persecution in myanmar as i mean so i would say that uh, the house is absolutely right when you say that there are you know Unfortunately, we didn't have enough discussions of radicalization process and the drivers as one of the participants said that we need to understand and do a dispassionate analysis of like what people, what factors drive people into this path of radicalization. And definitely there are domestic causes, there are external causes, there are individual causes as well, psychosocial factors that trauma, identity crisis uh, that, that drive people into extremism. So, so, so I agree with both of you that uh, there are domestic and external factors. and. And, and the problem is that, you know, when you talk about countermeasures, it is beyond the ability of the state to deal with all these things. What can we do about the, about the Rohingya crisis or the Israeli-Palestinian crisis? I mean, you can, you can, you can develop a counter-narratives and go to the prison cell. And, and as, uh, as Dr. Zahid was asking, like, you know, when all these injustices happen, even in the neighborhood, like how effective is going to be your counter-narrative that is designed for de-radicalizing someone? Because you can't disagree with these happenings, right? 
when people say that I'm angry because something bad is happening in my neighborhood, in right, that you are referring to NRC in India, maybe you are referring to the uh, Rohingya injustices in in Rakhine State, you are referring to Kosovo and and uh, Palestine, and even Guantanamo Bay, 800 detainees without any justice, right? When people try to understand that the American government denied the prisoner of war status to the 800 uh, Guantanamo detainees, they don't know the technicalities. All they know is that 800 people were uh, were kept in a military detention facility by the superpower without indefinite for indefinite period without any fair trial opportunities for them, right? So it is difficult. Co developing a counter narrative and feeding it into a didactic program is, is really a challenging task. I think the, the best possible way is to, is, to, is to appeal to the people that we also, we are also ang you know, angry, but, uh, but there has to be a non-violent way of dealing with this. Right? That kind of message that we, that, you know, I mean, you can't hurt your own society. You know, killing, killing, killing our own children and, 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 so, and people in the name of violent extremism is not going to be taking you what you are, what you are wanting. So I think that kind of, and interestingly, you know what, we have never had any systematic effort to engage the psychologist, clinical psychologist, right, and, and, and also professional religious scholars, other than imams and the others. We haven't had a systematic effort to make the best use of them into a well-designed well de-radicalization de and rehabilitation programs. So we need to deal with this. And, and another, another problem is that, you know, there is a lack of synchronization of their force. Cognitive psychologists will treat problems in one way. A religious scholar will do. Security studies analysts will deal with. But there is a need for, you know, fusion of the, all these uh, response communities. And I think when General Munu said that, you know, you can't, it's a very specialized domain. You can't leave it to general. I think he was being very frank that uh, if, you are, if you are part of a law enforcement agency actor, you are arresting people, you are interrogating people, then you are doing high risk operations, then it is your responsibility to do rehab? Absolutely not. You need, it's a very specialized domain that needs the, you know, skills, understanding, patience, and, and very different mindset to, to deal with the threat of violent extremism. Um, and I think I partly answered uh, General Shahid's, uh, I tackled the, the, ob the observation that 800 detainees in, 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 in and, and you know what? Uh, interesting. One of my doctoral thesis in the University of Pittsburgh in USA. You know, my first chapter I wrote was on uh, uh, legal and ethical issues in the war on terrorism. And there are two case studies that I wanted to propose. One was the U.S. drone strikes in FATA, and the other one was uh, Guantanamo. And in both cases, interestingly, international laws of the war or Geneva Conventions were grossly violated. Let's make it simple, right? There was no legitimacy behind the drone strikes that killed 90 percent innocent civilians plus 10 percent. They call high-value targets in the FATA area. Uh, technically, the United States did not declare a war against Pakistan, so all these strikes coming to a Pakistani sovereign territory would be blatantly called a violation of the international norms of sovereignty. And also, given the fact that uh, um, the, the laws of the war uh, makes a distinction between you know, the, the, the doctrine of necessity, distinction, and proportionality. When you are using brute force, you have to make a distinction between what is permissible target or what is impermissible target. All those uh, victims of the drone strikes, most of them, innocent civilians, let's say, I mean, were the doctrine of proportionality maintained there? Did the, did the drone, drone strike, uh, you know, it was it was a remotely controlled strikes, right? So those who made that decision, did they make the distinction that well, when Baitullah Mesud was going to be targeted in 2009, right? That uh, that uh, he would be a legitimate target. But what happens to his father-in-law living in the same comp in a complex? His family members, his kids, his wife were they legitimate target? What I'm saying is that drones are called precision strikes, but you know there is a circular error probability and. and and there is a high probability that people in the vicinity will also be the unintended consequences or the collateral damage of the attacks. So, so, so interestingly, these have been there, and, and we do see public apologies from the U.S. and NATO administrations sometimes you know, on, a, on, a, on a specific basis. But, but again, these have also fueled the process of radicalization to them to some extent. Similarly, I think that uh, the, you know when Obama came, he was very candid, and he he wanted to shut down the Guantanamo Bay. And he wanted to actually uh, repatriate these people to their own countries, but there was a fear. You know, if I, if 
China want, did not want to take back the, the Uyghur uh, people who were uh, held up in, in Guantanamo, other countries also. So I think there was a big dilemma. In, in addition to, to the dilemma that these people were kept there for, for a quite longer term. In addition to that, the gross uh, violation of the human rights, the pictures of uh, Quran being abused, the pictures of uh, waterboarding, those were also very, very disturbing. So I think this discussion is very relevant because when the state uses excessive use of power in the name of counterterrorism, that can further cause radicalization. So I think that, that discussion is very relevant. Um, our um, our students actually ask some very interesting questions uh, about witness protection. I think Shafkat has has has, has answered it. One one of you asked about the bias definition. Of, I think yes. Uh, I mean, terrorism is a very subjective phenomenon, right? And 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 we agree on this assumption, and then start we start this discussion, right? And I think that uh, in today's forum we have focused mostly on faith based extremism. But if we want to be objective. Let us bring the other non-faith-based extremism in Bangladesh context. So CS should be there. Comprehensive perspective, then definitely uh, non-faith-based extremism will also be be, be broadly discussed. Um, and I think I almost at the end. Tarin, your question is very interesting that uh, arms smuggling, drug smuggling, gold smuggling, and murders. I would not use the word terrorist uh, attacks. Because what happens in the Rohingya camps is the, is the local um, Let's say Ramda, Kirich, and the local, locally made uh, weapons are found in their camps, Crimes. right? And um, and and uh, the local district administration does produce a monthly report. And if you look at that, the latest number of murders in the camps are mentioned. And so the number of 50 murders that you mentioned possibly came from the government reports, actually. So now, and in most cases, these are petty crimes and in-group or within between group fightings that produce this casualty. Like there is a different hierarchical system in the camp governance, Majis, deputy Majis, and there are organized criminals. The organized criminals attack the Majis and deputy Majis because the Majis and the deputy Majis are seen as a as a crony of the state. Right? So there are different. What I would say that keep in mind, if we keep discussing it in a in a non-sensitive manner, we fall into the risk of criminalizing the refugees or the forcefully displaced Myanmar nationals. Right? We need to be very sensitive because there are two different lenses to look at the Rohingya issues. One is a issue of humanitarianism, which requires Rohingyas to be treated more through the lens of refugee protection, humanitarian protection. Largely speaking, we are talking about one million approximately. We we keep talking about 1.1 million, but let's let's be let's let's correct the fact. A joint verification of the Rohingya community have been done by Ministry of Home Affairs and the UNHCR. And the number is currently like less than 10 lakhs actually. So 9 lakh, 9,000 if I'm not wrong. Let us reproduce this number and correct it, first of all. So 99% of these people are have nothing to do with violence, criminality. They are victims of genocide. They are victims of ethnic conflict. And they need humanitarian protection in when they are in, in, in Bangladesh, right? There's a very small minority of the Rohingyas have documented cases of involvement in Paddling Yaba, right? Uh, carrying uh, gold when they came, and then uh, different petty crimes and organized crime. So when it comes to dealing with these, uh, petty, your question is whether there would be any nexus between these criminal activities and terrorism. Whether we can think of crime terror nexus in the context of the Rohingya, right? And I think that the answer is that uh, let's say who would be the right target for the Rohingya people, right? They are they have collective you know, uh, grievance, which is actually directed against the Myanmar state. I think the biggest concern is whether moving the target, whether they'll be moving the target against the Bangladesh state. If yes, then whether it is a concern for us, right? So far, there has not been any single evidence, right? Documented case where the Rohingyas have attempted to organize and plan to carry out attacks against the Bangladesh state. Out, if it, my data and my understanding and observation is correct. Under what then the next question would be under what circumstances they might possibly be a threat to us, right? And then, well, um, then would be different circumstances. I would say, like uh, forceful rep you know, repatriation efforts could be uh, driving them nuts. That could be one possibility. The other could be uh, manipulating the Rohingya grievances by domestic political opposition or existing terrorist groups, right? What about Hashan
right? Uh, relocation to Vashanchor, would they anger them? Possibly, but 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 interesting, I would say that uh, maybe, let's say, let's say the recent data shows that roughly 25,000 Rohingyas have been relocated to Vashanchor, and the plan target is to relocate 1 lakh, 10% of the, the, the camp based Rohingya in Cox's Bazar. Initially, lots of uh, concerns were there. Uh, the donor communities and the even communities were not convinced. I think the government has done a pretty good job in PR campaigns. Maybe if, I, if my reading is correct, uh, the donor communities have been convinced that relocating Vashanchor is, is there are better opportunities and better at, at least accommodation and other facilities for for them. But would would Vashanchor relocation be angering the Rohingyas, making them radicalize? I don't I don't see that. But but if there are reports coming out that uh, Rohingyas are being abused in Vashanchor. Their ability and willingness to reunite with their families in Cox cannot be you know, appreciated and entertained. Those, but there are cases where they, are, they can go back to Cox Brothers, see their families, and come back. So, so, so I think that there are lots of sensitivities, and it's a good concern, and the state has to accommodate it. But in a nutshell, I, I would say that uh, the, the dominant approach for the government should be to deal with the Rohingya issue through the lens of humanitarian protection, which is still the policy, and definitely. The message for the uh, uh, field level responders, Cox Police, right? BGB is there. RAB has a new battalion. Army is the lead actor in security, uh, ten divisions, right? So, and I'm pretty sure that each has a very good uh, coordination role uh, as well, and and it is being widely monitored. So, I think the biggest challenge for us would be to make sure that the Rohingya sentiment is not driven and manipulated by the regional extremists, AQIS, and 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 homegrown extremists to to capitalize it and direct it against the Bangladesh state, right? So that, so that should be our prime concern. I think that I, I finished everything. And there's one thing from Nafis. Nafis talked about mass people welcoming. Yes, keep in mind, in the, if, we, if we want to implement a rehabilitation strategy, would, would it not require going to the victims sexually and ask them, do you want a rehab strategy to be putting in place? Because if my family member has been a victim of terrorism, shall I want the Perpetrator to be getting maximum punishment or to be freed from the jail and right and then getting rehabilitated. So I think that all stakeholders, including the victims and the lo and the local communities, need to be brought on board and be appreciative of the of a rehabilitation program. We are talking about f roughly 1,000 plus prison-based extremists, but what about the the sympathizers in the society, right? A rehabilitation program would be good for the prison-based extremists. But for the for the at-risk at population, vulnerable communities, the de-radicalization programs need to be a continuous process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Uh, wonderful discussion. Before I turn back to my co-host, editor of Dhaka Tribune, if you want to mark your calendar for our next joint roundtable on 25th of October, it is going to be on the current issues in Myanmar. I thought this will be of something of interest to most of you. The invitation cards will reach you in time, but please do mark your calendar for 25th of October, a roundtable on Myanmar issues. And I'll turn back to Mr. Z Zafar Soban, our co-host and editor of Dhaka Tribune. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to our two panelists and also all of you who have um, been very active participants in making this an extremely rich and engaging discussion. I think what's come through for this, if you had asked me, uh, or I think the average layperson um, in Bangladesh to look at the um, situation of terrorism in Bangladesh in 2022, on the surface it seems as though, you know, we are in a very different place from where we were um, uh, 2015, 2016, 2017. On the surface, it seems as though the threat is much diminished and we don't really face the kinds of um, extreme activities which were seen then. And I think uh, Shafkat had mentioned that, that in the early 2000s, that was another, an earlier spate of um, high level terrorist um, um, activity here in Bangladesh. So on the surface, it seems as though uh, the threat is. Is, is, is very low compared to where it has been in the past. And I think that's true as far as it goes, but I think what we have learned in this discussion is that while the threat is low, 
the threat is always present with us. And while we have had a lot of success in terms of our operational opposition and counterterrorism, we have perhaps had less success and have um, provided less um, concentration on the uh, de-radicalization and the more the soft power approaches of how to uh, deal with the with the, uh, with the, um, the threat of terror. And I think uh, this is a point which General Malir had made is that ultimately these are ideological issues. There's only so much you can do to address these with a law enforcement or indeed a military uh, response. You can, uh, you can have operations, you can apprehend uh, terrorists, you can uh, arrest them, you can, uh, you can kill them. But at the end of the day, as long as we do not take the steps to de-radicalize, we do not take the steps to try and address the ideologies which are fueling these, um, uh, these actors, then long term, medium to long term, it will always come back. The threat will always remain. And of course, um, many of the, uh, the, the, the speaker, uh, the um, uh, participants here have also talked about other problems such as root causes, injustice in the world, and that's been addressed, I think, very well by um, uh, Professor Ashraf. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, of course, we do live in an unjust world, and this is a point Shafkat made as well. We live in an unjust world. There's all manners of injustice around, and a lot of the grievances which fuel uh, terrorist tendencies may be may well be rooted in 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 in, in, in just cause may well be rooted in um, uh, a legitimate sense of grievance. Our challenge is is a is a is a is a, is a state is a security apparatus is a society is to while acknowledging that these grievances and these injustices may exist, to always make this point, and this is, I think, uh, what uh, Professor Ashraf said, that violence and terrorism can never be the answer, can never be the solution. And I think that, um, that uh, discussion, that society-level discussion, is something where we really need to uh, put more emphasis. Uh, it's one of the things we've talked about a lot, that we need to be adaptable. I think uh, that was General Munir's point. We, the, the, the terrorist threat is, is adaptable. It's flexible. We need to be adaptable. We need to be flexible. And we need to ultimately take this much more seriously than we're taking it. We have had on the surface success, but at the end of the day, if we do not have a comprehensive strategy, if we do not have a coordinated strategy, and we don't, then we cannot rest easy thinking that this problem will solve itself or this problem will diminish by itself or this problem will go away. It won't. I think one of the things we have learned very, very uh, clearly from today's discussion is we really need to step up our efforts in terms of de-radicalization, in terms of addressing the ideologies behind terrorist attacks and uh, ter um, um, terrorist activity. And ultimately, we need to focus on de-radicalization is, is the goal. And we need to bring all of the organs of the government, the organs of the state, and indeed society, ourselves, together to bring us uh, and bring our efforts to bear to work on this. We cannot rest on whatever laurels we may we may have. We really need to. Um, we really need to coordinate ourselves and work closely on this issue. So I think that is the real takeaway from this discussion. And so once again, uh, great appreciation for everyone who's been part of this. Uh, great appreciation to BIPS, of course, for co-hosting and uh, doing most of the heavy lifting of putting this discussion together. Thank you all very much for being here. And. Um, See you all, we hope, on the 25th, where we're going to have another discussion on a very uh, burning issue of the day, which I suspect, unfortunately, will be equally important, if not more important, on the 25th as it is today. Thank you. Thank you. Before we all leave this hall and move out for a cup of coffee, please join me in giving a big hand to our panelists today. Thank you.